Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our presentation today. I'm Lori, and I am a Modern Work Solutions Specialist here to help moderate and assist with answering your questions today. Today, we're continuing our Modern Work webinar series with a focus on establishing a solid foundation to migrate to Exchange Online. If you've been considering this move, you may have some preliminary questions like, where do I even start? What should I be aware of? How can I accomplish this? And these are all valid and common questions when beginning to embark in the M365 cloud journey. If you'd like to catch up on any of our past webinars as well, we're placing our YouTube channel in the chat and we will continue to upload the recordings moving forward for your convenience. Helping with moderating today is technical specialist Ryan Ding. So please feel free to post questions in the chat and we will do our best to answer there. We will also have a few minutes at the end of the pre presentation for Q&A. Our amazing presenters today will be technical specialist Oscar Rangel and fast track escalation engineer Mamou Tohami. Oscar, take it away, sir. Thank you so much, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Oscar Rangel. I am a dad and a husband. I do have 17 plus year experience in the IT field, coming from a background of being a former migration velocity manager. I am a modern work enthusiast as well, and a former fast track engineer. Currently, I am a technical specialist in a modern workplace. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Mamoud. Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining today. My name is Mahmoud Tohami and I'm a Fast Track Engineer and Canadian Technical Fast Track Team Lead. Previously, a Migration Velocity Manager, assisting customers reaching their cloud onboarding objectives and goals and have 11 years of IT experience. So we're very excited to have you today and we'd like to talk a little bit about the exchange to exchange online migrations and building your foundation. So let's talk about building confidence in your move to the cloud. So our agenda today, as you can see, we'll discuss how to start a migration for on-prem exchange to exchange online and followed by a demo. We'll also have my esteemed colleague Oscar discuss the Gmail migration to exchange online followed by a demo as well. And we'll discuss next steps and we'll end the call with Q and A's. So, you are ready to convert your mail, uh, your mail users on premise to a remote mailbox and migrate to the cloud. This will give you the benefit of centralizing your email and having a sustainable business mail model. So, let's talk about some considerations. Essentially, you want to start with your identity or identifying your personas, and that comes in the form of executives, um, the account team or management team as well as your frontline workers. So you want to choose the right license to make sure that you have a successful migration. So having an E3 or E5 license or a standalone exchange plan one or plan two will suffice for your migration. I'd like to point out that F1 licenses do not have mail included. If you want more information, you may contact your Microsoft account team who will be happy to help you. As well, you want to meet your prerequisites, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail for the exchange migration from on-prem exchange to exchange online, as well as Gmail to exchange online. Following that, you'd like to build your tenant or have a tenant available. If you do not have a tenant, Microsoft can assist you in building out your tenant and setting it up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail to help with your migration timeline. So furthermore, accountability. So the accountability is primarily identifying your stakeholders and understanding which migration task is going to be performed by whom. And by identifying that, you will understand what are your requirements needed to assist you with your migration project. So if you do need assistance, Microsoft offers a complimentary service, a fast track, where I currently work, that can assist you with moving your migration and helping you successfully move to the cloud. So furthermore, if you need adoption details, Microsoft can help you 
and provide you with adoption details by building out or helping you build out your communication plan, which occurs before your migration and during your migration as well. So that being said, best practices can also be provided, and I will show you that in the admin center as well and will be placed in the chat here today. And finally, your governance, which is an activity for your post migration to protect the migrated data through through uh, advanced threat protection initially and driving towards your zero trust security model. So let's go to the next slide. So identifying your path, and this really depends on your source environment. So if your source environment is an exchange 2003 or 2007, you have two options to migrate. You can either migrate through a cutover migration or through a stage migration. Now, even though a cutover migration does allow up to 2000 mailboxes to be migrated, due to the length of time it takes to migrate, we highly recommend using a cutover migration for 150 users or less. It's also important to ensure that your ports 6001, your TCP port 6001, 6002, and 6004 are open on your Exchange 2003 server. For your stage migration, your source email system is either Exchange Server 2003 or 2007, and if you have more than 150 mailboxes. The best method is to use stage migration if you have these source environments for more than 150 mailboxes, because if you do use cutover for more than 150 mailboxes, your migration performance may suffer due to that. For your exchange sources of 2010, 2013, 2016 and later, we highly recommend using exchange hybrid. And the reason for that is that it's the most commonly used migration method for 90% of our customers at Microsoft. And essentially what a migration, a hybrid migration does is that it provides you a seamless experience for your mailboxes on-prem and your, for your mailboxes in the cloud, which gives you the flexibility to choose to leave mailboxes on-prem and migrate the majority of your mailboxes in the cloud. So hybrid, which is the most common method, as we mentioned, gives you that seamless coexistence and also helps you decide how you want to route your mail, depending on where the majority of your mailboxes will be found. And finally brings us to the last migration option, which is IMAP migration, if your source is different than Exchange. So IMAP migration allows you to migrate your mailboxes and the mail folders only. It does not migrate your tasks, your contacts, and your calendar, and has a limitation of 500,000 items per mailbox, as well as an email limit of 35 megabytes. So that concludes this portion, and I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Oscar, to discuss Gmail migration. Thank you so much, Mahamud. Just give me one second. I am going to take over. Oh no, we are going to continue with this. Perfect. Um, so Gmail migration. So we, there, there are two different approaches, right? Uh, we have the code over and the stage approach. For the code over, uh, it is recommended for companies that are moving up to 2000 um, mailboxes uh, or less, right? Um, usually and typically those companies are uh, migrating for a couple of, of days or over a weekend. And then for the, the stage migration, uh, usually those companies are uh, 2000 mailboxes and above. And for the uh, stage migration, we have three different approaches. We have the automated, we have the manual, and we have the PowerShell. Um, automated process is uh, something that um, the Microsoft engineering team put together to make our customers' life easier. Now, the manual process is for um, people that are really, really technical, that they, they like to, to customize the migration experience, go review every single step on that journey. And then the last one is the PowerShell, right? If you're pretty uh, proficient in PowerShell, you have to go um, to that uh, option. And can we go to the next slide, please, Melon? Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Um, so for th there are a couple of things uh, we need to consider when we are migrating, right? Uh, there are some factors and when you are migrating on-premises mailboxes to uh, Office 365 or when, whether you're coming from G, uh, Gmail, uh, the overall migration speed and performance, uh, it's something we, keep, we have to keep in mind. And for that, we have this list, right? The, the data source is important. The device or service that hosts that data to be migrated. Uh, many of those limitations may apply to the, the data source because of the hardware specifications and user work, workloads or backend maintenance. An example could be the Gmail limits, how much data can, can be extracted during a specific period of time. Now, the data type and, uh, and density. Because of the unique nature of customer's business, the type of and mix of mail items within mailboxes vary greatly. Uh, I'll give you an example. One 40 gigabyte mailbox with 400 items, each with 10 megabytes uh, of attachments will migrate faster than another one of four gigabytes mailbox with 100,000 small, smaller items. Now the migration server, uh, many migration solutions use a jump, what we call a jump box type of migration server or workstations to complete the, the migration. Now uh, uh, an example there could be a customer often use a low performance virtual machine uh, to host the MRS proxy service. The migration engine is another one. The data migration engine responsible for pulling the data up from the source servers that com converts data. And if necessary, uh, the engine will then transmit the data over the network and inject, inject that data into the Microsoft 365. Now, on that note, the migration engine is a common source of confusion for our customers using MRS or mailbox replication service and migration service to perform migrations into Exchange Online uh, is migration concurrency. The most basic definition for that um, is migration concurrency is the number of moves that are allowed to run at the same time against a particular migration endpoint. And it makes sense that all on-premises environment are different, right? Or customer's environment uh, are different. They, they have different number of mailboxes, different uh, number of items, and the admins needs to configure those numbers uh, to move the, the run at the same time. Uh, so, and it, it has to be according to what the environment can support. Now, another example could be the networking appliances, right? The end-to-end -end performance uh, between the point A to point B. Um, an example could be firewall configuration, any specifications on the on-premises organization that dictates that the firewall has to have certain rules for, the, for any traffic that is, is passing through. And the N365 or Office 365 service, um, it could be uh, some of the features that are already there. And an example could be the end user throttling policy that um, has the default settings and limits the, the overall maximum data transfer rate. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Mahmoud, to discuss Exchange Hybrid. Thank you, Oscar. So I'll move to the next slide. So let's talk about on-prem exchange to Exchange Hybrid and its prerequisites. So for your Exchange Server hybrid deployments and considerations, a hybrid deployment provides that seamless look and feel of a single exchange organization between your on-premise exchange and your exchange online. So for your on-prem exchange organization, your on-premise environment should be patched to a supported level to prepare you for your migration. So what does that mean? This will determine your hybrid deployment version that you will use for one, and for two, your hybrid deployment requires the latest cumulative update or update rollup that is available for your version of Exchange. Furthermore, is my tenant supported is a common question. 
So hybrid deployments are supported in all Microsoft 365 plans that support Azure Active Directory synchronization. Microsoft 365 apps for business and home plans do not support hybrid deployments. For your domains, you can register any custom domain you want to use in your hybrid deployment with Microsoft 365. So how you can do that, you can either do it through the portal or by optionally configuring Active Directory Federation services, commonly known as ADFS, in your on-premise organization. The next step will be deploying your AD Connect tool. Now, deploying the Azure Active Directory Connect tool to enable Active Directory synchronization with your on-premise organization is crucial to ensure that your identities are synchronized. The next step is your auto discover DNS records. So configuring the auto discover uh, record for your existing SMTP domains in your public DNS to point to your on-premise exchange servers, or if you have an exchange 2010 or exchange 2013 to your client access servers or to your mailbox servers for 2016 or 2019. Furthermore, on your prerequisites, managing your environment from your Exchange Admin Center, which really is a benefit of being able to manage your on-prem environment in Exchange, as well as your Exchange Online environment in a single location. Assigning your Exchange services to a valid digital certificate that you purchased from a trusted public certificate authority is also a main prerequisite. And finally, hybrid deployment protocols, ports and endpoints. You need to configure those ports and protocols and connection endpoints in the firewall that protects your on-premise organization as described in the articles that we're going to share. Which brings us to your migration project timeline. So let's talk about that a little bit. Now, in terms of prerequisites, initially the starting point is your identities. So to identify your identities, we highly recommend using the ID fix tool to significantly reduce remediation tasks that are identity related when synchronizing your mail attributes or your OU's organizational units through Azure AD Connect tool. Also, it's important to ensure to understand that your mail flow design depends on where the majority of your mailboxes are. So whether they be on premise or exchange online for the majority part, completing your hybrid setup by leveraging the hybrid configuration wizard will assist you with that. Having your certificates available also and ensuring that you're ready for the test and validation level. So when it comes to the test and validation, we want to assess your source and target by following the migration best practices, which will be shared with you as well, and I'll also demonstrate where you can find them in your admin center. This will help you have a full understanding of your end-to-end -end migration and follow the recommendations and best practices provided. When it comes to your scheduling, it's also important to understand the prioritization. So being able to prepare your schedules by prioritizing which mailboxes you want to start with first, and this comes with establishing early adopters and building your FAQs. Brings us to the last step, which is the migration portion. Now, when you're starting your initial migration batches, we recommend or highly recommend starting with a pilot batch with approximately 150 gigabytes to 200 gigabytes of data amongst your pilot users. This will provide you with an estimate throughput of gigabyte per hour that will tell you how your migration is performing. So when you're facilitating your, your scheduling for the future migration or velocity migration, you'll have a pretty clear idea of what your timeline is going to look like based on the speed of your migration. So let's go to the next step and have a quick understanding of the additional activities and accountability. So for your on-premise exchange to exchange online, there are end user communication. So this type of activity occurs before and during the migration and most of the time, or in most cases, the organization is responsible for it, or it can leverage a partner or a Microsoft partner to assist with it. Same thing with scheduling. An organization is responsible or accountable for this activity, or can, rec or can request a Microsoft partner to assist as well. Migrating the data provides either a self-migration for the organization, a Microsoft partner can be leveraged, or the complimentary fast track service can be requested if the requirements are met. 
and they can help move your data for you at no extra charge. An additional fix, fixing migration failures. In addition, fixing migration failures is a customer or Microsoft partner responsibility. Same with end user training and planning, which customers can leverage through public documentation or can request a Microsoft partner to manage it directly. For migration issues, a self-migration would be an organization's responsibility. If it is a partner-led migration, it would be a partner responsibility. And if it's a fast track migration, it would be a fast track responsibility, which has an entire fast track migration team to assist with providing remediation steps remotely. Post-migration issues are also an organization responsibility or a Microsoft partner who has taken on the migration project. And finally, adoption activities can be either uh, the customer or the organization itself, uh, Microsoft partner, as well as Microsoft Fast Track. So let's do a short demo, and I will go ahead and share the Exchange Admin Center, as you can see here. So in every Exchange Admin Center, if you go to admin.microsoft.com, you will find the advanced deployment guides. And what the advanced deployment guides do in the home page is provide you with step by step guides <clears throat> to help you deploy your cloud services. Since we're talking about email migrations, we will go to the email setup guide over here, <clears throat> which helps us step by step. So to set up email in the Microsoft Cloud, <clears throat> you select the default option, migrate email from other email systems to Exchange Online. <clears throat> And I'd like to highlight over here the option for assistance. If you're an organization that has 150 seats, you may leverage Fast Track for assistance for your cloud services. However, if you have 500 seats, you can leverage Fast Track for your to move your migration and perform the migration for you. Fast Track. <clears throat> can be uh, accessible directly or requested from your admin center where you can find the link here in the deployment guides. Because we're focused and most customers do a hybrid migration, we're going to select the default option to perform a remote move hybrid migration. So as you can see here, the steps are outlined and all the documentation prerequisites and adoption tools and links are available for you to leverage. Step one, running your hybrid configuration wizard, which will take you step by step to set up your hybrid connection, set up your AD Connect tool, and also choose your authentication method. And then the next step, which will take you to your Exchange Admin Center. And I'd like to take a few moments to talk about your endpoint and how to manage it. So in this case, I'm going to switch over to the Exchange Admin Center, and we'll talk a little bit about managing your endpoint. All right, so as you can see here in the Exchange Admin Center, if you'd like to create an endpoint, you just need to go to the Migration tab in your Exchange Admin Center Classic and select the three dots, which are found on the right-hand side of the plus sign to add a batch. Now, the importance of the migration endpoint is that it is basically the settings and the credentials used to connect your on-premise server to your M365 or Office 365. And what that means is that it is absolutely essential for your migration performance that you have the correct settings on your endpoint. So by default, the endpoint has a two to one ratio, same as the Gmail migration that was discussed earlier, you have your maximum concurrent connections, which is the maximum number of migrations or mailboxes that can be migrated simultaneously. What that means is you can set that a two to one ratio with the maximum concurrent incremental syncs, which is the delta sync after a mailbox has reached 95%. So that being said, on your first pilot, you can leverage the endpoint by default settings. And based on the throughput that you receive, which is the gigabytes per hour migrated, you can determine the total number of data of your batch divided by the number of time 
or the number of hours that it took to complete to determine that throughput. And then you can start tweaking those numbers also at a two to one ratio. So for example, 40 to 20 or 60 to 30, et cetera, and see if your throughput gives you a better gigabyte to hour performance. Based on that information, you can start making the changes for your actual velocity migration. Now I'd like to point out that increasing your settings on your endpoint doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be faster. It all depends on your network capacity. However, if you find that increasing it does not have an impact or reduces your migration performance, then it's best, of course, to go back to the default settings. And that being said, I have completed over here the discussion on on-premise to exchange migrations. And if you have any questions, please do post them in chat and I will pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Oscar Reichel. Thank you so much, Mahamud. So let's talk about Gmail to Exchange Online. Um, as discussed previously, uh, there are two options, right? The stage and code over. And since most of our customers are um, leveraging the stage approach, that's what we are going to discuss today. Um, so understand and know that there are some uh, prerequisites. And I am not going to go through each of the bullet points, but know that most of the heavy lifting is going to be done on the Google side. As we need to prepare to enable several APIs, set up the forwarding and validate the domains. Whereas on the Microsoft side, our prerequisite is to have a mail user type, provision with the proper license assigned, and perform a validation on the migration endpoint. Of course, we need to add and validate the domain that we are going to use for this migration, but it's just the minimum requirements on this side, and uh, we are going to discuss and, and cover those in detail as we uh, move forward. Now, uh, throughput limitations for contacts and calendars completely depend on the uh, quota restrictions for your tenant service account on the Google Workspace side. Other migration limitations are described in the following uh, list, and some of them are um, limitations that come really um, for the, the target G uh, Gmail mailbox size, right? Um, there's one really important in here that we have to understand and, and, and have that clear is that the, the mailbox size from Google, once it comes to the Microsoft side, it can increase up to 10 or, or even 20%. So that's something we have to consider. Let's talk about an, a limitation on Exchange Online is 100 gigabytes on the primary mailbox, correct? So if we happen to have a 80 gigabyte mailbox, for instance, and then we try to move over that 80 gigabyte by mailbox to Exchange Online, that 20, that 80% mailbox can increase up to 20% and we can run out of the space easily. So that's something we have to consider and that's why we encourage uh, our customers to uh, execute some cleanup uh, tasks prior migrating over. Now, the Google migration tool typically uh, migrates up to uh, eight, or 10 gigabytes per day per user mailbox. That limitation is on the Google migration tool. It's not on the Microsoft, but that's something we have to keep in mind, right? When we are moving, especially when those mailboxes are over 10 gigabytes, uh, they can take up to two days for the move to, to finish. And it's just due to the fact of that limitation. Now, uh, this uh, slide represents a fictitious company name, Fabrican INC, with the, nom the no domain name um, fabricaminc.net that is performing uh, their migration. Now, let me grab the, the pen so you guys know where I am at on this graphic. So prior to the migration, the MX record is still pointing 
oh, probably I have to use a highlighter instead. Just one second. Perfect. So that the DNS record is still pointing to our domain in Gmail. Nothing has changed. In step number one, emails are coming from here and being delivered on Gmail. Nothing changed. So before migration, we need to do some prep work. We need to make sure all of the, the mailboxes contain aliases. And that alias is a domain that we have to create an ad on the Google, and I am going to get to that point on the demonstration. But just to know that uh, you have to include this subdomain as part of the alias for all of the, the mailboxes that are going to be migrated. Now, you, once you add that domain on the, on the Gmail site, you also have to add an Office 365 subdomain on the Office 365 site. And that Office 365 domain, it's going to be added as an alias. And I'll explain why. Um, now, as you can see on this, uh, on this site, because uh, as we learn, one of the prerequisites is to have the mail enabled users on the Office 365 site. This mail, uh, mail user object has an external email address at gsuite.fabricam.net, which is the same, it happens to be the same alias that we have in here. Now, the purpose of this is because we are prepping for migration, right? So anything, any email coming from here to you, from user two to user one is going to be delivered here. Nothing has changed. There is no communicate, no communication in between these two tenants at the moment, right? But when we move to step number three, this is when the fun stuff starts. Um, remember we added those aliases, right? And those are, aliases are here highlighted. And so in this example, we are only migrating user uh, one and user two. And then as you probably can see, what, what used to be the external, uh, and this is during migration of a single batch, by the way, um, and we are still using user one and two, for the example. Um, now this mail flow, right? It's going to be, this is going to become a mailbox type because we assigned a license and we are kicking off the migration. So that means data is being injected from user one on the source to the destination, which is the mailbox, Office 365 mailbox. And so this is going to start receiving all the content, but because this migration has not been finished, we still have a forwarding SMTP address that is going to revert back any email to my, my original or source mailbox. So in this case, we are still using user number two. And then this user number two is sending an email to user number one. And this is being forwarded to num uh, user one source mailbox in Gmail from Office 365. So this is during migration, right? Uh, we are still migrating. Data is flowing from here to here, but any email that is coming from um, another mailbox in Office 365 or even someone utilizing this subdomain, it's going to be forwarded to this source. Now, what happens on step number four after the migration of a single migration batch is completed? There are some things to, to highlight in here. So what used to be an alias over here in user number one will remain as alias, but then uh, there's no external email address anymore. Now we have a forwarding in place here because this user is already migrated. So what happens if user three sends an email to user one? This is going to get forwarded to my mailbox, which is already completed, and it's going to land on user number one on the Office 365 side. Now, the same flow happens from user two, which is also happens to be already migrated. It's going to 
email is going to flow from here and it's going to finish over here. There's no forwarding back and as it was on step number three. Now, this is the final step, right? After the migration is completed, DNS change and now points to the Office 365 side. So this is the desired state and final state um, where you have to go to the registrar, DNS registrar, you make this change. Any new incoming email will land on Office 365. Now let's talk about the timeline. And this is based on uh, previous experience from other customers. What we have seen they, they go through is the different phases, right? The prerequisites, they have to meet the prerequisites, configure API scopes to allow permissions, uh, setting up the migration endpoint, uh, creating the domains for forwarding or routing purposes, then validating that the endpoint uh, migration is, is working properly. Uh, we can even use utilize this phase to perform an end-to-end -end migration, uh, spin up a couple of mailboxes, right? Uh, making sure if there's any errors to remediate those errors and then identify any potential blockers and remove those blockers before moving to the testing phase, which is having some early adopters, right? Exciting new, new people, uh, people providing feedback, that feedback is going to become in, in an FAQ, internal FAQ according to our environment as a customer, and then a scheduling, right? And this part is when, when we start thinking about moving production users or even pilot groups, right? Um, and then when, when we move to the pilot phase, which is number four, uh, we want to make sure we start slow with a couple of users here and there. If you have, if your organization happens to have a small department that probably they are used to changes, it, you, it could be IT itself, or it could be an, any other department that uh, you guys have, have used for, for the same purposes. And then you move to velocity or production users, and that's when you start moving uh, big masses, right? Big, big numbers of mailboxes. And then as we also saw in the Exchange Online migration, Exchange on Prime to Exchange Online, there are additional activities and accountability for those. Um, and these, these are pretty much similar to what you guys learn in user communications, who is going to handle that? Usually the customer does, uh, the partner assists with it. Uh, there are partners out there that can assist it with, it, with the scheduling. Then the migration itself, it, it's uh, accountability is split up in between the customer partner and if those customers are leveraging uh, Microsoft Fast Track services, Fast Track can, can come in and, and help you. Uh, they just get plugged in and, and they will help you move those uh, velocity numbers. Then fixing migration failures, uh, usually the customer and partner, especially if those migration are part of the environment. Uh, either the, the the source on the Google side, uh, you may want to engage Google, right? If there's something going on with the service, um, or you, you may want to reach out to support to find out and learn more about those issues. Uh, the end user training and planning, customer and partner. And however, Microsoft has a pretty, pretty powerful um, um, website that we, we can include you in, in the summary email that our customers can leverage the, this for, for training purposes. Migration issues, um, it depends on where the, the issue uh, stands, right? If it's within the Microsoft service, Microsoft Fast Track will take care of this. It will escalate with the product group, with support to any engineer that is um, involved on that process. If it's on the customer side, then the customer or even the partner, if partners engaged can assist there. And then the post-migration, issues um, then customer and partner and any adoption will be customer partner and Microsoft with with those links and, and resources that we can um, assist you with. And let's get to the demonstration. And let me go ahead and so this is the exchange. So th there are uh, a couple of, of uh, sites that I wanted to highlight. 
So when you are preparing your source environment, you want to make sure on the admin uh, of Google, you want to make sure um, that you go under security, access and data control and API controls that you are providing domain-wide delegation for your project. Now, the instructions on our official documentation state that once you create your project, it's really important to create or to provide domain-wide delegation. Why is that? It's because the service account that you create as part of the project on their prerequisites, it's going to need and require access to authorize any any um, access or or calls to the the source mailboxes essentially to be able to manage anything right the, the passwords anything related to the accounts the data that is being is extracted from the source so that's the importance of having domain wide delegation now the other piece involved on this process and this is on the developer console so we are going to get to the api library and there are uh, four important APIs that we have to uh, consider when, when we are moving to, um, to Exchange Online. And here in the source under Google Workspace, Google Calendar API is one. You want to make sure this one is enabled. And this is just for the migration endpoint and for the project itself to, to have visibility and access to grab those items on the on end users calendars and the same goes for the gmail right uh, we want to make sure this is enabled these two are pretty essential for the migration process and then if we go under social there are two other importance and one is contacts to be able to uh to view edit or or access to any of the contacts and the other is the people that provides access to the the, the uh, that uh users or, or people profiles and contacts. So those four are the only required for this uh, project, for this migration project. And remember, keep in mind, it's Google uh, People API, Contacts API, Google Calendar API, and Gmail API. Now let's hop into the, the test user mailbox, right? As you probably seen, this is a, as, as the name suggests, is a test user, a test, test mailbox. So I'm only utilizing 51 megabytes out of the 30 gigabyte. And just, just notice that uh, this is my domain, old McDonald had a, a cloud. And so this is my, uh, my source domain, right? And so if I go back to my users, of course I, I have uh, famous people plus my, uh, my admin and my two test users mailboxes. And then what I was highlighting here is if we go to the domains here, we want to make sure we have the G Suite the domain, which is going to be an alias, right? And this alias is for the Microsoft 365 email site to be able to forward emails back to this alias. And then the M365 domain or subdomain that it's going to forward emails over once the migration is complete. So this is, think of this as, as the uh, stage state, and this one, once the migration is completed or the those mailbox my, uh, migration is also completed. So essentially anything on their way or before migration will be utilizing this alias and anything completed will be using this as a forwarder over to, um, Microsoft 365. And now let's hop back to the M365 Admin Center. Uh, so just so you know how I got there. Um, oh, one important thing to consider here is the validation of the domain over here. Um, this is the same domain I have on my Google site. And so let's hop to do, into the home um, and then Let's go to the exchange real quick. And this is how you get uh, to the exchange, uh, the new admin center. And you can, uh, there, there are two different approaches, right? You can do uh, the new experience or you can do the classic. I'll show you both. 
uh, in the new experience, you go under migration, and then you add a new migration batch. Uh, you create a, a unique migration batch name, and then uh, you call the, the migration type or path, which is going to, to move uh, migration to Exchange Online. And then the type of migration, we're going to use uh, Google Workspace or Gmail. And then here, if we were um, like if we were to happen not to enable the, the source environment, we'll have to follow this automated process. Or if we feel brave enough to use the manual, our most uh, customizable option, we will do this or follow these steps. But since we already set up the migration endpoint, we are just going to have to uh, click next. And then this is where, where we select the, the migration endpoint and then import the CSV file. Important thing to highlight in here in the CSV file is uh, this is the format that the, the system is going to ask you. This is the source, uh, this is the target. Um, and the source will will be on this side, and so this domain will be my old McDonald have a cloud dot com. That's it for the CSV file. Then you fit the CSV file. You click next, and pretty much the same. Uh, the rest is configuration. And let me see if I can go through this really quick. And then important uh, format here is we have to use um, CSV file format. And usually the best option here will be um, to use the um, UTF-8. This is just to avoid any, any issues or anything. So let's go ahead and save this. And then Let's try importing this. Click next. Then the target delivery domain. This is where we are going to use our M365 or McDonald at a cloud.com. And then uh, this is where we, we select uh, if we want to migrate mail calendar content rule. And if we want to, uh, if we desire to skip any folder or item on that migration, we're not going to do that for this purpose. Uh, just making sure we are using the, the right uh, system administrator account and then options to kick off manually, automatically, or to complete the, uh, the uh, handle the completion right manually, automatically, or, or complete the schedule at completion. So we are allowed to do so. That how sweet is that, right? And then the time zone where our happened, our our uh, environment happens to be. And so, because we are not going to run the migration, just uh, this was to prove the this process. Let's hop to into the classic view really quick. And so, on the recipients and then migration, this is where we are going to see the same as as we saw on Exchange High Rith. This is coming from Google. This is my migration endpoint. Uh, so thus, just so you know, uh, we have concurrent migrations and everything. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> the same, right? Uh, same approach. Uh, this is uh, the JSON file to set up the, the endpoint, but we already have it set up. And this is how you select. And pretty much most of our customers are familiar with this view. That's why I wanted to show the, the new uh, in this option, we will select a workspace, then we'll grab the CSV file. And then it's the, the same thing, right? One mailbox to migrate. And then more options if we want to skip verification. Uh, checks the migration endpoint, make sure it's uh, able to talk to the source. And then the options to filtering uh, to provide a migration batch name. And then same options to manually or automatically uh, kick off the batch and for the completion piece. Um, once we click new, this is going to kick off. And with that, uh, we conclude our demonstration and we are going to hop back into the presentation. 
to talk about what's next. Um, so if you would like to hear more about migration or have a deeper conversation with uh, Microsoft, uh, reach out to your accounting team, your ac account executive, a specialist, um, system, customer success account manager, whoever, whoever that person feels more comfortable with, uh, they can help you align the right resources for this. And then learn more about uh, Fast Track Center. Uh, We're going to provide you with those details. Uh, the same uh, goes with what if you need more white glove service, right? Uh, if you want someone to that can help you with the scheduling or even with the post migration adoption or even um, uh, resolution training, uh, Fast Track Area Partners can assist you there. And um, I'm not sure, Mahmoud, if you want to add something in here. I think you pretty much uh, nailed it there. Um, but just to maybe reemphasize on, on the detail for the fast track uh, for those who, organizations that have 500 um, seats, they can leverage the fast track migration as mentioned earlier. Um, however, if you have 150 seats or more, they can leverage fast track for their M365 deployments in general. Great call out. Yes, those numbers are, are, are really key to keep in mind. 150 seats, you get advisory and deployment assistance. 500 seats or above, you get migration assistance. Thank you, Manuel. Oh, thank you. Are there any questions from our audience today? There actually was one question. Um, it was a little bit ago, but here's the question. So how would a uh, an administrator move higher mailbox sizes like 500 gigabyte and so part i answered part of this with considering of course the maximum mailbox size within exchange online which is 100 gigabytes with exchange online plan two and then i did also mention of course one trying to clean up the mailbox before you migrate that and then two enabling auto expand archiving as any of that extra would need to be placed in the archive um, but I also wanted to check in with you guys to see if you had any additional guidance or suggestions or things to keep in mind for uh, attempting to move mailboxes of that size. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm going to speak about my personal experience and I will let uh, Mahmoud chime in. Um, usually those are considered white glove uh, migrations mailboxes. And the reason that is due to the nature of nature of the size, right? Um, as, as you, Laurie, called out perfectly, uh, the limit of the primary mailbox is 100 gigabytes, uh, right? And it could be auto expanded, yes. But however, there, there are some considerations uh, to, uh, to, to keep in mind, right? If you're coming from on-prem to the cloud, the migration, uh, the auto expand, it, it, it doesn't kick right off, right? It, it doesn't do it right immediately when you engage the, the auto expanding functionality. So it takes time. It could, it get, as far as I remember, it can take up to 48 hours. Um, I could be wrong. I can get those exact numbers. Uh, but as, as far as I remember, it's a process, right? And it's it kicks off right when you hit that 100 gigabyte it doesn't do it before and it, it auto expands once uh you get closer to the 100 it will it will gradually expand up until one terabyte i believe that's the limit uh at the moment um but i will let uh Manuel chime in if there, there's um anything uh extra Absolutely, Oscar, and thank you, uh, Lori and Oscar, for for mentioning that. I mean, you've left me with a little work. <laughs> so, um, it, essentially, larger than 100 gigabytes, and I, I would say even 85 gigabytes, just to be on the safe side, to give uh, a, a bit of uh, a bit of, um, of, of of space there to ensure there's no migration errors. Um, anything above that, uh, your options to migrate it with a as a PST, right? Or if you have the possibility to break it up into multiple PSTs uh, to reduce them to a smaller size, that is another approach as well. 
there's multiple ways to do it, but in terms of the move request capacity um, above 100, or, and I even say 85 just to be on the safe side, is not uh, a possibility uh, right out of the gates. So uh, there are some third party tools that can be leveraged for larger mailboxes, uh, like Oscar said, um, if you want a more uh, white glove approach through a partner, uh, or if you want to purchase a third party tool, but essentially those are your options. PST, break them up or leverage a third party tool or partner. Awesome. Hope that helps. It does, and thank you. That that opens it up for myself as well to have a, a better understanding of that. Um, we do have one more question. Um, I might have to look this one up, but uh, one of the questions, oh, uh, Ryan might actually be responding to it, but the question was, uh, do we offer these, um, you know, fast track migration services outside the US like uh, LATAM or Europe? And it looks like Ryan awesomely answered um, that there is, it's available in all markets. So thank you for providing that, Ryan. Yes, and, and that's the official documentation. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, there are 27 languages, which a few of those can be uh, leveraged uh, in, in the US, right? In the US, there are customers that speak more than one language. And so uh, there are resources across the, the entire globe. Uh, within the, the US and the, the America, the continent, uh, there are like Spanish, uh, French, uh, Canadian French, right? Um, English, uh, that might, oh, oh uh, Portuguese uh, from Brazil, and just for the American and, and plus whatever is on Europe and Asia. Uh, but I believe Mahmoud can, can add on top of this as well. That, that is correct. That is absolutely 100% accurate. Uh, so it's available in all regions. Uh, they're broken up into three regions. Uh, the Americas, uh, which includes uh, LATAM, Latin America, uh, EMEA, which is um, Europe, Middle East and Africa, and APJ, Asia Pacific and Japan. So it pretty much covers all, all of those areas. It's just like Oscar, uh, Oscar and, and gratefully uh, Ryan posted there. That's, that sums it up. Perfect. That answers the question. It looks like it absolutely did. Um, I don't see any additional questions, but we do have about three minutes left. Um, I thank you for moving forward to that. Uh, Oscar and Mahmoud, great presentation, great demoing. Uh, really appreciate the time and effort uh, that you guys put into this. Um, it, great. Um, so I just wanted to, again, thank you for that am amazing presentation. I just also wanted to send a reminder of the next webinars we will be presenting over the next few weeks. You can see there are a few that are doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the Viva modules. Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, we did um, a day in the life of Viva, uh, a general overview of, of what the Viva modules look like from an end user perspective. And now we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So into the topics, learning, connections and insights piece. But I also want to specifically call out the next uh, segment of the building a strong foundation for your move into the cloud. So this one will actually be covering the data migration pieces. So OneDrive and SharePoint Online. Uh, always, there's always um, lots of great questions when it comes to moving that type of data from you know either Box or uh, Google Drive or or whatever uh, network shares that you you know that uh, many customers might be uh, utilizing currently. And then, of course, finally, we do have a Windows 365 overview uh, coming up as well. So lots of good webinars um, coming up here. Um, at the end of this call, well, actually, probably, to be quite honest, uh, tomorrow we will upload this recording into our YouTube channel. I had placed that into the chat earlier. And as uh, as well as sending out an email that will have all of the helpful resources with all the URLs we've shared in the chat today and some additional ones. Um, and it looks like still no questions left. Hopefully we answered everything. Again, if you guys have any additional questions, please reach out to, of course, you can reach out to Microsoft support at any time. Um, but if you do have a dedicated account executive or a specialist that you, or even a partner that you work with, um, feel free to reach out to them as well and they can get you connected to the correct resources to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, but with that, it looks like we are at the top of the hour and I want to thank um, once again, Oscar and Mahmoud for the great presentation. And thank you, Ryan, for helping me moderate. 
Um, and thank you uh, to our guests who joined this webinar today. It's completely appreciated. Uh, we hope we shed some light on uh, moving into the cloud for exchange. But thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks.